Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! Hey guys, welcome back to Japan Archives, episode 43. Last week we finished off our Blossom story, and this week we're gonna go back to one of our supernatural creatures. We said we were gonna do the Kappa, so we'll look into its appearances, its interests, some Kappa stories, and then for Heather's section today, you're doing a song, I believe, yes? We are indeed. Or I am indeed. I guess we will be doing it because I have a plan. But that's for later in the story. So today, like we said, we're going to do the kappa. I feel like I should ask you what you already know about them. You're... So kappa are mythological creatures. And they look kind of like turtles. And a, there's a plate as well. They have like a plate on their head. But I forget why they have the plate on their head. And I see them a lot as mascot characters now. Okay. So you know a little bit. A little bit. Not much. So first of all, the Kappa, they've actually had a lot of different names throughout their history. Um, and also it kind of depends on the area of Japan you're in, like local dialects, local names for them. So you can also find them called Mizushi, Kawataro, or Kawarawa, which is quite difficult to say three times fast. Kawarawa. Kawarawa. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> So when it comes to their appearance for the creature, and this creature as well is particular to the island of Kyushu, although it does seem to be quite widespread around Japan, there is a general consensus of a creature that will have a depression upon its head that is full of water, or like you have said, it can be a bowl of some kind instead holding the water, and this water is where the creature gets its power from. But... The other parts of its appearance can be left to a bit of interpretation, again, dependent on where they are found in Japan. Some would tell you if they came across a kappa, it was the, roughly the size of a 12 to 13 year old person. But others would say it was even smaller than that and be only the size of a two to three year old. Body wise, again, it can vary wildly. Some have said they have faces which are ape like. Sometimes they've said to have shaggy hair. Others have said they have a face like a tiger with a snout. And others still have said that they look like otters. Their bodies can look like a tortoise, like you said at the start. Sometimes they can even have, have wings. And at other times, they have scales covering their body. So how do you know you've seen a kappa? But there's so many different descriptions. Like, you, you know, that, that might be a kappa. Well, that's the thing I found quite interesting. I read something about how... A university professor asked some people to draw a kappa, and they kind of drew the same image, the idea of a creature with water on its head and a tortoise body. So all of these other depictions, I'd feel that they're more historical. Because as you said now, when you see them as mascots, they do, they're all the same image, the idea mm. of a tortoise with a little bowl on its head. So I think back in the day, all of these different descriptions, from what I assume is... They were called Kappa due to the stories which related to them. Like stories of, okay, it might have looked like an ape, but it lived in water. Oh, it had the snout and it looked like a tiger, but it liked cucumbers. So maybe the appearance wasn't very standard Kappa, but all of the other things attributed to it were Kappa-like, so they became Kappa, perhaps. But I still haven't finished there with their bodies. Oh, we got more. There's more. These creatures are going to have webbed feet and webbed hands. They'll have an overall greenish body and the strange ability to rotate their arms and leg joints freely. Sounds kind of like a, a doll I had when I was a little kid. That sounds horrific. Okay. Yeah. And if your back's turned and you're not sure if there's a kappa approaching from behind you, there will be a distinctive fishy odor coming from the creature. Now, as you've seen, there's a lot of different depictions but the general consensus will is always the water on their head 
Ah, so there you go. Maybe that's what it is. Like, you know, that's got a fuzzy body and wings, but there's water. Kappa. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. That's probably is it. Mm. Now, if you are a kappa and you want to go to sleep one night, strangely enough, even though they're a water creature, they can't sleep in the water. They have to sleep on land. Um, but to do so, they have to remove their waterproof skin, known as the amagawa. And when it comes to things that these creatures enjoy, they're mostly known for their love of cucumbers, but they also have a fancy for sumo wrestling. And at times they've been shown to enjoy other foods such as eggplants and melons. But when it comes to their run-ins with people, there is something else that they do very much enjoy. And this is called the shiri kodama, which I will mention soon. Hmm, okay, I think I know where you're going. I recognize the beginning of that word now that I've heard you say it. All right, cool. So, hmm, I like, I, you know, I did kind of identify with kappa because I love cucumbers. I, I think cucumbers are great, honestly, one of my favorite foods. So, but I, I don't, and I do identify with the melons and the eggplants. Uh, sumo wrestling is interesting, but I didn't know about that. I knew about the cucumbers, but not about the other fruits and vegetables. Oh, okay. Briefly linking back to the oni, like we said, there were the general descriptions, but then there were different types of oni. There was shooting doji, for example. And we can see this as well with the kappa. There are various other yokai, which are said to kind of be offshoots of this creature. So one of them was known as the kawa akago, or the red river child. And the other one is known as the suiko, or the river tiger. The first one, so the Akago, is said to have lived high up in mountain streams and resembled a human baby, whereas the Suiko resembled a pangolin and actually had knees as sharp as a tiger's claw. And this final creature wasn't native to Japan and actually hailed from the Sushui River in China. I also find these yokai interesting in that they do not at all have any resemblance to the very, very wide range of kappa appearances that we've just been through. Mm, no mention of, of water on the head either. I think the only thing that links them is their connections to water from the looks of it. Is it kind of like, I'm going to use pop culture reference, like Care Bears and Care Bear Cousins, or you have kappa and kappa cousins? You know what, I'll take it. I think the analogy works. I'm going to take that. Now, there are actually some faiths and some religions that do worship the kappa in a certain way. They are seen at times as water kami or water spirits. There's even some agricultural communities that denote them as suijin or again water spirits and due to this they actually have celebrations for them which will hopefully ensure that the farmers would then have enough water for their rice fields for the coming year. And if you were in one of these communities and you hadn't a mischievous kappa running about, you could always appease them by leaving cucumbers at the nearby shrines for them. Have you seen a, have you seen a cucumber at a shrine before? I honestly haven't, but it's probably one of those things that now I've read it, I will notice it. Like you never notice learner drivers until you become a learner yourself and then you see them everywhere. There is a specific effect for that. And it escapes me at the moment where if you, you encounter something, then you just start noticing it everywhere just because you've been exposed to it. Called the Bader Meinhof phenomenon. Ah, okay, yeah. Really rolls off the tongue. Which is why I couldn't roll it. Mm -hmm. So I said that they can be mischievous and that they had an interest in the Shiri Kodama. So due to their mischievousness, there is a high chance that a kappa will actually attack you should you come across one, though there are rare instances of tales showing them that they have actually saved drowning children. But all of these attacks, if they do happen, will take place either in water or at least at the water's edge. So one way to avoid this, at least if you follow this superstition, is don't go swimming after you've eaten cucumbers. Because if you do, the kappa will smell the cucumber and it will draw them towards you. That is good advice because I like cucumbers. I will make sure not to eat one when I go swimming next. But to finally answer the question of what is the shiri kodama? Now, apparently this is a type of life force, but one that lives in your colon. And due to its location, I'm just going to say that if a kappa wants to take it from you, there's only one place it can go through to try and get it. So if you are swimming, please mind your butt. <laughs> there are some others that do say that 
The kappa don't always go for the shirikodama and instead they just want your liver. However, they will try and steal your liver through the same way. So again, please protect yourself while you're swimming. I don't think it's even possible to get your liver through that particular method. Where there's a will, there's a way, I suppose. But if you're fortunate enough and the kappa does not want to take these things from you, you should still avoid the water because they might just want to drown you for fun. And if you run onto them and if you run into them instead on land, you have to be prepared for a fight. Unless, of course, you wish to repel them away. And if you want to know how to do this, you can turn your attention to a woodblock print from 1881. The woodblock print is by Tsukioka Yoshitaka. And it shows that if you wish to repel a kappa, then... <laughs> I don't... I saw what you did there, too. <laughs> yep. Then you should fart in the general direction of the kappa to scare it away. I'm sorry, I tried to say that with a straight face. It didn't work. It didn't work. Is their mother a hamster? I fart in your general direction, kappa. But let's assume... I'm trying to compose myself now. This episode is getting out of hand. But let's assume you don't want to do that. Let's assume you have a bit of respect for yourself and instead you decide to fight them. What is the best way to do this? Well, first of all, the capper, even though they're a bit murderous and they have a want for fighting, they are respectful. So if you bow to them before your fight, they will reciprocate and they will do the same. This actually will help you in the long run. This will cause the fluid to fall out of their head, which is the source of their power. And due to this, it will take their power away, meaning you can actually fight them and have a much, much higher chance of winning against them. However, I did read some... Most of the books I read did say that this is how you win the fight against the Kappa. However, one book I came across did also say that winning is not what you want to do, because if you do so, you will only waste away and die anyway. Parts of Japan even claiming that Kappa killed two people a year through fighting. Actually, now that I think about it, perhaps it is best to repel them away from yourself with the aforementioned method. I have a question, because I, I was looking up some things about Kappa, and I've I read somewhere too that if you spill the water from their head, if you replace it with water from where they, the, the same source of water they got the like it's like the river they got is from a specific river. If you replace it with that water, they have to serve you. Like they are now your kappa kappa minion. Now I didn't actually know that about the kappa. What you were saying it does ring a bell though. I that might have been something I heard when I first came to Japan. Oh, and I have a question. This is not something I've referenced. I've, I've referenced. I've researched, or you mentioned. But what if you take a cucumber with you to the water and you throw it like you would? Like a, you know, a stick for like... Like a dog. Kind of, like for your cup. Like, here, here's a cucumber, please take the cucumber. And you throw it far away from you. That'd be effective. I think that that would work. Like if you happen to have a cucumber and you threw it away from you, they would probably go after it and you could run away from them. So just make sure you always have some cucumbers on hand when you're walking along the rivers. I could do that. Now, turning our attention to some kappa tales, our earliest reference of a kappa, when it was known in its earlier form of Mizushi, comes from the Nihon Shoki, and the story itself relates to AD 379. The story says that a strong man declares that he has grown tired of the kappa in the nearby area that is killing people, and so approaching the river, he throws in some calabashes, saying that if the kappa can sink them, he would leave the creature alone. But if the kappa couldn't sink the calabashes, then he would kill the kappa. I think it's interesting again to see that we've mentioned calabashes mm -hmm. before in that if a god could sink them, he's truly a god and the god couldn't. So I, fe I feel that in older tales, calabashes were used as a, like a test of strength, use a calabash. So now I have to see if there's any more calabash stories in these old documents. There's a few more tales I want to tell. This first one, it's not really a tale. It's just like a tidbit about Tokyo. Apparently, there's a bridge in Tokyo called the Kappa Bridge. And the legends say that the first Kappa Bridge ever built in Japan was built by a raincoat merchant who actually used Kappa as laborers for the building of the bridge. So I guess these creatures are also 
skilled construction workers. But as for the actual stories, the first one comes from a collection of tales called the Tales of Tono. And Tono is a small village in Iwate Prefecture. And this is literally a book of folklore and fairy tales that were collected from the local people of this area. So this capital from Tono says that there was once a pond called the Gorobei on the Sawahi River. Now a person once lived close to the river's banks and he would often go and collect water from there. One day he wandered off and a kappa came forth trying to drag the person's horse into the water and take it for themselves by tying its reins around its waist. But the horse was too strong and so it dragged the dangerous kappa into its stable. The kappa panicking, trying desperately to find a place to hide could only find the horse's feed bucket to hide under. Eventually, when the person came back to feed the horse, he picks up the bucket and finds the kappa hiding there. The creature immediately apologized for its bad behavior and said it would stop being a thief, and it even wrote a letter of apology which can still be seen to this day in the house of the owner. We can also have some kappa can write. Well, you would think that, but the second story, which I will disclaimer is, Remarkably similar. So here we go. In times of old, a kappa once lived on the river of Kawachi, and he had a habit of taking and killing numerous villagers and their livestock. One day, he tried to steal a horse. And here the similarities begin. But the horse was too strong, and so it dragged the creature away from the river. But this, in this story, it dragged it into a nearby field where the villagers then came together to tie up the creature. Most cried out for the creature to be killed due to all the death it had caused them, but the owner of the horse had a different idea. He wanted the creature to promise to stop his evil acts, and so a document was drawn up. But the kappa, though it could speak, said that he could not write. And so he signed the document by dipping his hand into some ink and pressing it down onto the page. And from that day, the kappa never killed again. And the document was kept at the temple of Kawako no Miya, built on the banks of the river Kawachi. The similarity of the story was quite surprising, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I was expecting, oh, perhaps another Kappa story relating to something bad happening along the river. But I didn't expect it to be a horse again. I didn't expect the Kappa to be pulled away. I didn't expect him to sign a letter, which was then kept forevermore in a building. Yeah, they're, well, I guess if, if there's a different, are these from the same locations in Japan? Uh, well, no, Sawahi, Sawahi, Sawahi and Kawachi. Kawachi is, I think, Kitakyushu. Sawachi is... The first story I told relates to the tales of Tono, so that is up in Iwate Prefecture. So they're quite a distance away from each other, yet still so strikingly similar. So yeah, different prefectures have their own versions of the story, like what we saw with um, Momotaro. Different prefectures had claimed different origin stories for well, it's all similar, but they they claimed that he came from here. So it's, I guess different prefectures have their own versions of stories of common themes. Mm -hmm. Now the next tale: there was once a woman who went to use her outhouse, but she was scared away when she felt a hairy hand stroke her buttocks, and so she fled, telling the local doctor, who said that he would deal with the problem for her. Now the doctor goes to the outhouse and waits for the hairy hand before cutting it off and taking it back to his office. The next day, a kappa comes along asking for his hand back. And he says that if he doesn't apply medicine soon, he will be unable to reattach his hand. The doctor allows him to take his hand back on the condition that the kappa signs a waiver saying that he will teach the doctor how to fix broken bones. So though the story is quite different, again, we do see the story ending with the kappa signing a document. And also fixing bones. So do kappas have supernatural abilities? Or I'm guessing various supernatural abilities. What I got from reading between the lines of this tale was that the kappa could apply medicine to reattach his hand, which would oh, yeah. therefore fix and connect the bones. So the doctor was like, you can have your hand back as long as you show me this magical medicine so I can use it in the future for my own pa patients. I wonder what medicine it was. Oh yeah, I have, I have no idea. Too bad. Sounds useful now. Yeah, sure would be. Now the final story, I have a bit of a synopsis of it. It, it actually comes from 1927. It's quite a recent book. It's from a man called Akutagawa 
Ryunosuke, and he entitled the book simply Kappa. The story goes that there is a psychiatric patient called in the book merely number 23. And the story tells the, the time that 23 visited the land of the Kappa. 23 had lost his way in the mountains of Hotakadake and was surrounded by a group of strange creatures who then showed him around their home. 23 relates how he met with Kappa of many different occupations. One of them, called Geru, told him that unemployed laborers were gassed and then eaten by the other Kappa in the area. He met another one called Toku, who was a skeptical poet who had committed suicide and appeared to 23 as a ghost by means of necromancy. And Toku, while concerned about being famous after his death, admired writers and philosophers who had also killed themselves. And finally, on his return to the real world, 23 muses that the Kappa were clean and superior to human society, and so he became a misanthrope. So a rather strange book. And very different to all the other Kappa tales. After that tale, that is actually all I really have about the Kappa. There are obviously going to be other tales, like you said, the one about a Kappa becoming a servant of of you if you trick them into filling their head with a different type of water. Um, but I did not come across that story, unfortunately. I wonder if you could set them free. Like if you if you if they become your your minion, like can you set them free? Oh presumably you could. I would hope so. But with all the Kappa related things, Japan likes to draw upon their past a lot. And as for their legacy, you can see it living on in different ways. There are the Kappa Zushi rolls, which you can buy. There are the, which is the cucumber rolls. So named after the Kappa due to the love of cucumber. And there's also Papa Sushi, which is a restaurant. <laughs> a sushi restaurant. Yeah, I forgot about that. It's actually a pretty good restaurant. I would recommend it. And we see that they have lost a lot of their sinisterness over time. They're now used as mascots for different prefectures. There's even a mascot called Kapal, which is a Kappa for Shiki City. And you'll, like, you'll see them a lot now as well on TV adverts trying to sell different products. And banks. Banks have used them too. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I, I ran across that somewhere. This is a, a specific bank used them, I think. Also in TV shows, um, you'll see them in TV shows, in manga and anime sometimes. Especially for kids, it's for kids, for young kids, yeah. So yeah, that's all I really have on the kappa for today. Oh, the only other thing, there is a kappa in the Crimes of Grindelwald movie. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. But there you have it. That is all my kappa stuff that I found during the week for us. But what do you think? <laughs> I still love your um, your uh, your quotes. They're really great. Thank you so much for that. I I also the breaking of trying to read the narration. <laughs> really made my day yeah there's a lot of stuff that i was not aware of for the and i hadn't ran into any specific tales regarding them i didn't like you know just you you hear about them or you see them in pop culture but then you don't always get to hear some of the older folk tales about them so that was really interesting also i thought they were pretty much the same similar appearance but i really had no idea that there were so many different variations and what they could look like so i i like all the things that you found i'm so glad to be able to protect myself better from kappa the next time i go swimming um so that's really helpful to know <laughs> well i'm glad you found it educational very much so we're gonna go with educational that's a great that's a great word <laughs> it is but you said you were gonna do a song for us today so mm. i am intrigued as to who it is by before we get into the song. All right. So this, oh, this is super cool. I'm excited for this uh, because when I originally found this song, I found it for, um, I was doing a, I, I designed, so I'm studying for the JLPT. I'll give you a little bit of backstory. I am studying for the JLPT and one effective learning method is to teach the things you're learning to someone else because it helps to get it in your head. So I made a small little lesson about colors because that way I would make sure I knew the kanji correctly um, because sometimes the, the kanji for colors, I don't 
use them or read them so often. So, and there's a lot of strokes in some of them. And I try to learn to write it because it's better to actually write kanji, not just see it, but to actually write it. It gets it in your head, which is why kanji is super difficult because sometimes like learning the stroke order. But anyway, I picked the song because it had colors in it and it was a children's song, which meant it was repetitive and easy to learn. And so it's also good for people just learning Japanese. So I picked the song and, you know, learned it. And it wasn't until I started looking into it that I found who wrote it. And his name is Hakushu Kitahara, and he is a Tonka poet. He was born in Fukuoka Prefecture, so we're in the Kyushu area again, in 1885. And he was born into a family of sake brewers. And he went to Waseda University, which is in Tokyo, to study English literature but he didn't graduate. He wrote for several literary magazines and even started some of his own. But this uh, particular work we're going to talk about today, it comes from a children's literary, literary magazine, which I have encountered in the past and have been very interested to learn more. It's called Akai Tori, um, which, what does Akai Tori mean, Thomas? Because I know you know, I'm asking you, even though I know you know. <laughs> Red Bird. Yes, it's Red Bird. And it was published from 1918 to about 1931. But the magazine stopped completely in 1936. The magazine's goal was to create, collect and elevate the art of children's literature and songs. They asked several of the famous poets of the day to help write songs, to help with literature, to really try to collect all of the information and make, you know, children's literature very important highlighted an important part of learning. And Hakushu Kitahara was a famous poet at the time. He was asked to contribute. That is actually a pen name as well. So he was born Kitahara Yukuchi. So that was his family name. Now the lyrics of this song is from him. In the research I did and you know, su suffice it to say, I think I need to go a little bit deeper than what I've done. I didn't see a specifically conclusive link that definitely tied the song in the English information I found. It might have been there, but, you know, I possibly looked over it. But I am pretty sure, uh, but based on the title, that this song did come from the Akai Tori because this song is called Akai Tori. <laughs> so I, f I feel fairly confident in saying it's probably from the magazine. I'm going to read for you the first verse of the song. There are three different verses. I'm going to read the first verse, Thomas. And if you have your pen and paper ready, I would love for you to translate for me. Okay. Akai tori kotori. Naze naze akai. Akai ni o tabata. From what I wrote down, so akai tori, red bird, kotori, small bird. Naze naze, why why, akai. Red. So why, why, red. So why are you red? Akai mi o tabeta. Red. Something, something, tabeta. So past tense, ate. So he ate something that was red? Yeah, you're right. Um, It's red bird. So kotori could be like, you know, young bird, small bird, little bird. In this instance, yeah, little, little, small, young, all of those kind of work. And why, why are you red? And akai mi. So mi. I don't know if you're familiar with this word because I wasn't either. I had to look it up to make sure because I know the translation, but I looked it up and I'll give you the kanji later. But this mi means fruit. Is it the same kanji that I'm thinking of? Like normal fruit? Uh, no, it's actually mi. Like it's the, the kanji is uh, sounded as mi. So that is not a kanji I am familiar with. Me either, because yeah, we usually in beginner Japanese, which is, I still feel very safe to say I'm beginner Japanese. That's, we usually learn kudomono for fruit. So I was slightly wrong with my translation because I didn't know what me was. I was translating it as I ate something red, but no, it's I ate a red fruit. Well, you know, it is something, a fruit is a something. So True. I think you were totally right. You say, I ate something red. And I feel, I still think you'd be correct, in my humble opinion. I think you had it right on the money. Yeah, kuda mono, mono, you know, and kuda is, um, yeah, surprisingly, some similarities within those two kanji, but it's different. There's a, a few, yeah, actually, yeah, they're pretty different. So Thomas, based on what I have said for the first verse, this is a children's song and it's delightful and fun to sing because 
think a lot of children's songs, they are repetitive because they're easy for young learners to learn. The other two verses have different colors, but the pattern is the same. So if I gave you the English word for the color, I bet you could probably tell me the next verse. Do you accept this challenge? Yes. Okay. The next verse is white, like a heron. Shiroi tori kotori. Naze naze shiroi. Shiroi mi o tabeta. Bing bong. And <laughs> the last one is blue. Aoi tori kotori. Naze naze aoi. Aoi mi o tabeta. Bing bong. Yep. And that's the song. So it only does three colors. It doesn't do all of the colors in its song. I don't believe so. I think it is just these three. But I feel like if 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 I if I was going to to teach this, I would probably to make it kind of interactive with the students, kind of like I did with you. Not that you're my student, but still, <laughs> I would say I would throw out different colors because like that's something you could do with this. Like you throw out a different color and then have the students, you know, sing the song with the different color. So it makes it really fun, and then. Also, you could probably do it with other words too. You could probably change up like the different vocabulary words and different verbs, and so you have it memorized. And you could change it up and make a really nice little lesson. I like the idea of that. The lyrics, you know, they're just it's cute and it's silly, and this would have made me laugh when I was a kid. I don't know about you, but you know, kind of like if I eat a I'm, if I eat a blue fruit, I'm not going to turn blue. You're not like visiting Willy Wonka or anything. If you are visiting, you might turn blue. But you know, if I eat a blueberry, I, I'm not going to turn blue. So it's it's funny. Mm. It's cute. Um, and it's just cheerful and happy. The The song itself is very just, you know, cute. And it will get stuck in your head. <laughs> so like, what did you think, Tom? <laughs> I think like you said, it's nice and simple and like... Like you said, it's there for children, and it definitely has a lot of implications for ed teaching them things, which I like. And like we could even use that in our English classes. Like it's such a simple thing, you could even do it as like English practice because they're basic words. They could even try and write this whole thing in English themselves. So it's a useful tool for young kids, but also for Teaching Japanese and English, so I think it's pretty cool. Now, the interesting thing I asked the professor, uh -huh. he he had never heard the song, even though it's from probably around like the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. He he'd never heard of it. He's like, "What? What's this?" So I I actually taught it to him. That's cute. <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> we will come. We've already done some children's songs. Um, but I do want to come back to children's songs, which are called As There Are Many Famous Japanese Poets Who Wrote for the Akai Tori and Who Wrote Children's Songs and Children's Verses and Children's Poems. So we will come back to the Akai Tori and hopefully we'll have an episode about the magazine at some point. That would be cool. Well, thank you very much for the song today. You are so very welcome. Thank you so much for the cup, cup of facts. You're welcome. Well... If that is your song done for the day, is that everything from you? I think so. Is that everything from you? It is. So yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in this week. We hope you enjoyed it. But next week, what is next week, Heather? Oh my gosh. Dare, dare I say it? Dare I say it or do you want to say it? Should I say it? Should you say it? I don't know. I'm excited. Feel free. Okay, just a moment. It's our first year in review. We have been podcasting for a year. So next week, we're not going to have one of our standard episodes. It's the end of our first year. So we want to do one which is a bit more casual. We're just going to look back on the things we've done well, things that we could have changed. Things we've learned. Things we've adapted, things we've improved upon. So we hope you'll give it a listen. We're looking forward to doing it. But yeah, that will be next week. Um, so that will come out on a Wednesday. We won't have a Friday episode. We're going to take a week off from a normal episode while we prepare for year two. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Me too. We've, we've, we've only been talking about this for a little while, excitedly talking about it and talking about it. And like, yeah, it's, we're, it's, it's just, it's so cool to look back and go, we did a year. Like we thought at the beginning, like we, you know, it's very common. Well, you know what? That's for next week. It is for next week. I'll stop you there. I guess it's time for us to sign off then. I guess so. 
All right. Okay, guys. Until next week. Mata ne. Mina san, kiyotsukete. Mata ne. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N E X U S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane!